Recently, I released a video where I showed how to detect a range based on times and then trade on the breakout of that range. And I said at the time that I would be talking about a different type of range where I'm looking for consolidations. And so this is the video where I'm looking at a consolidation type range and trading the breakout of the consolidation. So in this case, by consolidation, what I mean is that price has stayed within a narrow band for a reasonable number of bars. And then when it breaks out of that band, I trade in the direction of the breakout. So to find those bands, I need to define a maximum range and a number of bars that I expect before it forms. So I don't want to form a consolidation range just on a single bar. Now if we look at the chart here as an example, if I started at this low point, and let's say I'm defining my range as being 20 bars, if I start at that low point and if I wanted to have my consolidation to be within 100 pips, say 1000 points, if I go back 20 bars with the tool here, there we go, 20 bars, that's 1476 points. So I don't have a consolidation range here. And as the price moves forward, when it gets to this bar, so the low is still at the low point there, if I go back 20 bars from there, uh, 20, no, 19, 20. That's still 1,240. But if I now move forward to this bar and go back 20 bars, 20, that is only 968 points. So a range would have formed as soon as this bar closes because by the time that bar closes, I have 20 bars that have a difference between high and low of less than my defined range, which is a thousand points. And let me just draw a box so that we can see that. So now I've drawn a box around the range. There are 20 candles in here. Between the low and the high point is just under a hundred points. Between the low and the high is just under a thousand points or a hundred pips. You can see then that the following bars remain within that range. So in my case, I'm going to consider that the range extends still beginning at this point, because that's the very first point I had where the consolidation range formed. So from that point forward, this box will extend. I can do that here until we get to this bar. Now the high on that bar is maybe slightly higher and I'm going to allow the range to extend as long as the extension doesn't bring that range beyond the 1000 points that I defined, which would mean that by the next bar, this will form a breakout at this point. So that's the way I'm going to be trading this. I'm going to define a range as starting as soon as a number of bars have formed within the defined range between high and low. That range will continue possibly extending upwards or downwards as long as the high and low difference don't exceed the range size until the first candle that breaks that range and I'll be trading, not waiting until the end of the candle, I'm going to trade as soon as I break the range here. Now, as I said, I released a video recently that traded based on time range and I'll leave a link to that in the description. That video and this one will also use the common toolbox which allows me to use the same functions for MetaTrader 4 and 5. And I'll also leave a link to the playlist where you can see how to set up that common toolbox in the description. So now let's move on to the code and see how we write this. All right, I've already started. I've created a folder here under Experts Orchard called Consolidation Breakout. I've created three files, Consolidation Breakout MQ4, MQ5, and MQH. And as I usually do, because I'm writing these for both MetaTrader 4 and 5, the MQ4 file just has comments, standard properties and include consolidation breakout.mqh, which is this third file. The MQ5 is the same. I've just changed the comment here to MQ5. Other than that, this is identical. And then I put all of the logic inside the consolidation breakout. And that way I can just write the code once for MetaTrader 4 and 5. So consolidation breakout.mqh here, I haven't written anything in here yet except the comment at the beginning and the standard property statements. Now I'll begin with the inputs that I need for this.
So I'm defining a range size, this is from maximum to minimum inside the range. And by default, I'm just going to set this at 500 points. And then I need to define the number of bars. And as I mentioned, number of bars, I don't want a range that's just one bar. I need to say that it's consolidated for a given number of bars before I consider that to be a consolidation. Now I'm also setting my target profit and target stop loss. And I'm defining these as a percentage of the range. Now the range is going to be fixed at 500 points. So in this case, I'm saying my profit is 100% and loss is 100%. So I'm aiming at a take profit of 500 points and a stop loss of 500 points. And as I usually do, a standard order size of 0 0.01. I'm defaulting the trade comment to the file name with the underscore, underscore, file, underscore, underscore. And just the default magic number of 21, 21, 21. Now I'm going to include a file to bring in the common toolbox that I mentioned. And the toolbox is underneath orchard common toolbox trade tradecustom.mqh. If I look here in the include orchard common toolbox trade and I'm bringing this trade custom file which wraps up the trade class that's included with MetaTrader 5 but also includes a trade class for MetaTrader 4 that brings in just the functions that I'm going to need. Now with that trade custom I get access to two classes the C trade custom class, and I'm declaring a variable I'm just calling trade that's of type C trade custom, and the C position info custom class, and I'm declaring a variable called position info. Now, I had an input of range size in points, I'm just going to convert that to price. I capture the input in points because it just is a little bit more portable between instruments that have five, four, or two decimal places. But then I need to convert that to an actual price sizing. Uh, this is just the variable to store that. I'll be doing the conversion later in the code. So that's my range size. I'm setting up to zero initially, but I will be setting that before I use it. I also need some variables to manage the range. So this is the range high, which when a range forms, I'll set this to the high price of the range. And then of course there's a range low, which will be the low price of the range. And I'm going to need the start time, the time of the bar where the range starts. I don't actually need this for the trading, but I'll be drawing a box on screen so it's easy to see what's happening and I need the range start time for that. Now I also want easily to know if a range exists. So I'm just going to set up a Boolean variable called in range. And then because some of the information I need isn't available during the on init function, uh, it's really only available the first time a tick happens. I'm setting up this variable called first time, a Boolean, and I'm setting that to true and I'll use that to trigger some action the first time I go into the on tick function. And now I have a number of functions that I'm going to be calling from the main part of the code. And I'll just write those functions first so it's easier to see what's happening. I'm going to start with the new bar function. Now this function I include all the time. I use it to know if a new bar has just formed. So first I'm declaring a variable. It's a date time. I'm just calling that current bar time. And that is using the iTime function for the current chart symbol and period for bar number zero. So that gives me the start time of the current bar. And then a static date time called prev bar time, which is initialized to the current bar time. So the first time this function is called is the same as the current bar time. And then I'm simply comparing those two. And I'm saying if the current bar time is not equal to the previous bar time, then that tells me that I must have a new bar formed. So then I reset the prev bar time to the current bar time. 
and return true because a new bar has been formed. And if I haven't already returned, then it means I don't have a new bar and I'll just return false. And next I have a function that I'm calling can trade, and this tests a number of values to determine if trading is enabled by the broker on your platform within the expert and so on. So these four values are all returning integers and if they are all true then it means that I can trade and if any of these are false then it means that for some reason I'm not allowed to trade. I'm going to be using this function because I simply don't want to go through all the work of preparing a trade and then attempting to execute it if I already know that I'm simply not able to trade. And then I have a function as I said I'm going to be drawing a box on the screen when a range forms just so that it's easier to see what's happening. It doesn't actually form part of the processing, it's just for visual effect. So first the name of the box, and I'm just using the trade comment name, or the trade comment plus underscore range as the name of this box. Then I'm checking to see if it already exists, because I don't want to just keep creating a new one. So the object find function looking at chart number zero for that name will return the chart number where it is found or the sub chart where it's found or a negative number if it's not found. So I'm just capturing this into found because I don't actually care where I found it. So if that range or that rectangle is not found on the screen then I want to create one. And that's a simple object create chart number zero, the name that I specified here, it's a rectangle sub window zero from the range start time and the range high price to the current time which I'm just getting with I time symbol period zero and that gives me the start time for the current bar and up to the range low. It doesn't really matter where the high and the low happen during that range these just set the corners of the rectangle. And if the object was found, then I fall into this else statement, and all I want to do here is resize that rectangle. So object set integer, chart number, name, I'm setting the time, and using qualifier zero, which is the first time, remember there are two, there's the range start time and the range end time. So I'm setting the start time to a new range start time. And I'm using object set double, setting the object price and this qualifier zero. So this is the starting price to the new range high. And then I'm doing the same for the second time qualifier number one and the second price with the range low. And the reason I'm changing these, as I said, if a range is formed and it doesn't quite take up the entire uh, default 500 points or a thousand points whatever I'm allowing the range to expand then until it reaches that size so if the range has already been drawn on screen I just want to expand the rectangle the next function I have is to actually open the trade this only takes two arguments the price where I'm trying to open the trade and the order type because I can call this for a buy or a sell I'm just creating this multiplier and that says if type is equal to order type by then the multiplier is one and if it's not then the multiplier is minus one and I'm going to be using that to set the direction of my take profit and stop loss. There's a price range which is just the difference between the high and the low and this is where I'm multiplying it by that multiplier so if I'm buying then the price range will be positive and if I'm selling the price range will be negative. So once I have the price range my take profit is going to be price plus the range multiplied by that profit percent divided by 100 and my default is 100% profit so this is simply multiplying the range by 1 and I'm using normalize double with the digits function to normalize to a price that I can apply. 
And the stop loss is very similar, but this time it's price minus range multiplied by the loss percentage. And now using the trade object that I declared at the beginning and the position open method, trade.positionopen, passing in the chart symbol, the type from this argument of the function, the order size, price, stop loss, take profit, and the trade comment. So that will place a trade in this direction at that price. And now I have a setup function, and this is the one that's called the first time I go into the on tick function. So I'm setting my in range as false. So when this expert starts, I'm going to say that I'm not in a range. And this is where I convert the input range size points into a range size. I get the value of a point from symbol info double chart symbol and the argument to that is symbol underscore point that gives me the size of a single point I multiply that by the range size in points and that gives me a range size in price and then I set the first time to false that was the global variable that I had let me scroll up and see that first time which I initialized to true and that's the way I force that function to be called once only by setting first time to false when the function finishes. Now, I also have a validate input function. I actually don't have any validation in here, but I've left the function because you may want to add some validation. And that simply returns init succeeded here because I don't have any tests. But if you have some tests and they fail, then return something other than init succeeded and We'll detect that in the on init function and exit there. So those are all of the additional functions that I need. Now let's go straight back and here we'll place the on init function. Now first this trade object, where is it? Trade object, type C trade custom. There's no place to set the magic number when executing a trade. That's done in the setup of the object. So I call this trade.setExpertMagic number and I pass in the input magic to that. Then I'm initializing result to init succeeded. And if result equal to validate input, so that's the function we just saw, this will both assign the result and test to see whether it is not equal to init succeeded. So if you return anything other than init succeeded from this validate input, then the on init function will return here immediately with that result. And typically that would mean a failure and so the expert won't proceed. If you get through here, then there's just return init succeeded. I have nothing more in the on init function. And then most of the work happens in the on tick function. First, I want to test if trading is allowed. So I'm calling that can trade function. And if that returns false, then I simply return. And this is where I test the first time variable and call the setup function. The reason I do that here, if I call this in the on init, then when you're first starting MetaTrader, it's possible that MetaTrader will run the expert if it's already loaded on a chart and call the setup before you've actually established the connection to the broker and before values are available. So certain setup needs to happen in the first on tick because by the time we get to on tick, we must have a connection to the broker or otherwise we wouldn't have called on tick. And that way I know that things like the symbol setup are done and I have current prices and everything else that I need. So that's the reason I'm calling setup here if first time in the on tick function. Here I'm calling the new bar function and I'm capturing that into a variable new bar. Now the reason I'm doing it this way, I want to call the new bar function now because I only want to do this the first time there is a new bar or I want to capture this the first time there is a new bar because there'll be some statements coming that can exit the function. But I don't actually want to test the new bar yet. I want to test it further down. 
So I'm capturing the value of new bar, running through some more code, and then I'm testing this later. And this is one of the tests that might exit the onTick function, and I want to make sure that the new bar has already been called. So I'm only trading if there isn't already a trade open. There are many ways to do this. I'm using something very blunt, calling positioninfo.count. That's a function in the common toolbox, passing in the symbol and the magic number. And if that returns greater than zero, it means I already have a trade open for this magic number and this symbol, and I don't want to open any more. So I'll just return. And now I just want to capture the current buy and sell prices. I'm capturing them here because it's easier to use these single variables further in the code rather than write this function each time. So the buy price is symbol info double for the chart symbol and using symbol underscore ask and the sell price is symbol underscore bid. Now if we are currently in a range, remember I have a variable here there it is, a global variable called in range, which I initialize to false. But if we are already in a range, then I want to check to see if we've broken out of the range. So first I'm checking to see if we've broken out on the buy side. And that's as simple as saying if the buy price is greater than the low of the range plus the range size. So I don't actually care how big the range has grown. If my current price is above the low by the range size, then I know I've broken out. And then I just call the open trade function, passing in the buy price and order type buy. Set in range to false so that I know that I've executed on that range and I don't just keep growing the range and testing. And then return. If I get through this, I have an else statement and then I have the same condition for selling. So if sell price is less than the high minus the range size, exactly the same logic. I know I must be outside the range if I'm more than range size away from the high. And then I do the same things. Open a trade, passing in the sell price and order type sell set in range to false and return. Now if we get to this point, because we have a return in each of these, the only way to get here is if we are in the range, but we haven't actually had a breakout, but it's possible that a new price has formed, which has expanded the range. So a simple test, if the buy price is greater than the range high, then I set a new range high equal to the buy price. And I call the draw range function to redraw that rectangle. And the same for the sell. If the sell price is less than the range low, then I have a new low price, set range low equal to sell price. And I draw the range again. And now because I'm already in a range, I've done everything I need to do there and I'm just going to return. There's no more processing to do if I'm already inside a range. So to get to this point, we don't have a range because we've passed the in range test. So now we need to check to see if a range has formed. But we're only going to check this on new bars because a range can only form when a bar has closed because I'm looking at the high and low of the previous 20 bars. So there's no point in looking at that tick by tick. And that's where I use the new bar variable. So if it's not a new bar, then I can get out of this early and save some processing. So I'm just setting some values. Because I'm not already in a range, if a range has formed, then I know the start time must be input range bars back. So I'm getting the start time as I time, chart symbol, period, input range bars. I'm setting the range high using the I high function for the chart symbol and period for bar number based on the I highest 
chart symbol and period, mode high to check the high prices, for input range bars beginning at bar number one, that's the bar that has closed. Do the same for the range low, but this time using the I low function, I lowest and mode low. So now I have range high, which is the highest price for the last N bars, and range low, which is the lowest price for the previous N bars, and the start time, which is input range bars back. And then to see if I'm in a range, I just compare these. So if the difference between range high and range low is less than or equal to the range size, then I know I've had a consolidation. So the previous input range bars have stayed within the specified size. And that way in range will be set to true if I am inside a consolidation range and it will remain false if I'm not. And then if I am in a range, I'm going to call the draw range. Now remember, I only get to this block of code if I'm not already in a range. As soon as this gets set, I'll be executing the code up here and returning before I get to that. So once a range is formed, all I'm doing is looking to see if I'm breaking out of the range or expanding the size. And that's it. Let me just compile this. I'm in the MT4 editor at the moment, so I'll Compile consolidation breakout.mq4. That had no errors. I'm just going to close this up and go to the MT5 editor and compile the MQ5 version to make sure I don't have any syntax errors there. And now in the MT5 editor, I just click compile there. And that also compiled without errors. So now let's just jump over to MetaTrader and I'll run this in the strategy tester so that you can see what's happening. So now I've started up the strategy tester for Euro USD. I've used the default settings. Uh, it's a one hour chart. Let me just let this run. So here a range formed and it was immediately broken out. So I've taken a buy trade there as soon as it broke through that range. You can see it's drawn the rectangle here and it has set a stop loss down at the bottom of the range. And if I shrink this a little, there's a take profit here also at 100% of the range. And so that's it, the take profit. It won't always do that. Um, and in case I didn't mention it earlier, I'm not promoting this as an all-in strategy, but if you are trying to trade on a consolidation and breakout, this is a good starting point for you to add your own features. Something like a trailing stop might help. Let's run that through and see the next case where this happens. So another range formed here and it's also immediately gone into a cell. And this one hit the stop loss. And here's a case where a range has formed, but we haven't immediately opened a trade and it's actually opened another bar and the range is extending. And you can see now we're getting more bars being created that are within the range. So the rectangle doesn't actually change unless we exceed the top or the bottom of the range. So this range is continuing for some time without breaking the top or the bottom. Now we've broken through the top of the range, taken a buy trade. And another stop loss but at the same time it hit that stop loss or as soon as it finished with that stop loss, another range formed and we've now taken a sell trade here. And so that is a complete consolidation breakout expert advisor. You can use this as a beginning of your own expert advisor, adding in your own features, um, risk management, lot sizing and so on. If you found this useful, then please click the like button. And if you want to see more of our videos, click subscribe and then click the bell icon to be notified when we release the next video. Thank you for watching.